how big of a problem is violence against EMTs? Well, it, it's really hard to find good numbers, good statistics on this, because they don't seem to be centrally collected any, in any one point. Uh, the National EMS Memorial Service uh, will tell you that about one EMT per year is killed on the job, that is when they're trying to help people. Um, the city of Boston did a study back in 2006 and that revealed that 28 percent of the almost 200 injuries that were suffered by the city EMTs were the result of violence. I mean, 20, I mean that's over a quarter of the, uh, of the injuries suffered by EMTs were as a result of violence against them. And if you're an EMT, you know, you're a paramedic, you know that you get assaulted, you get threatened on a regular basis. I mean, it just happens. So without trying to be hyper-analytical about this, the bottom line is that violence against you is an issue. It is something that, that's worth worrying about. The most important thing to bear in mind when you think about preparing for potential violence on the job is that you have to have the right mindset. Too often we go into a call thinking it's safe or it's probably going to be safe. I mean, we know when, when it's a high-risk call. We know when it's a bad part of the city. We know when we're going somewhere that there was, was violence against one of our teammates, you know, maybe last month. We know what sounds like a dangerous call. But if it's not one of those situations, the mindset is often, well, it's, it's another routine run. And the fact is, if it's not a known high-risk call, it's an unknown risk call. And this is something the police drill into their cadets at the academy. And that is that there is no such thing as a low-risk call. It's either high-risk, that is known high-risk, or unknown risk. And that's the way that EMTs and paramedics, and by the way, we're going to be using the term EMT and paramedic interchangeably in this presentation. But that's the way that EMTs and paramedics ought to look at the runs that they're making, either known high-risk or unknown risk. The point being here that when you jump in that truck, when your beeper goes off, when you get that radio call, whatever, when you jump in that truck, that you have to amp yourself up and say, I'm going into something that obviously is going to be stressful, going to require my competence and my, my skills, but could also be potentially dangerous. One of the reactions that you get a lot from some administrators and a lot of EMTs, in fact, is, well, we don't need to worry about whether we're going to an unsafe call because we never go there if it's not safe. We never enter a scene if it's not declared secure or safe. Well, you know, th that's a fine theory, but, but who declares it safe? Do you declare it safe? Do the police declare it safe? Does your policy address that? I mean, if you have to trade off between helping somebody and the scene not being declared safe, what does your policy allow you to do or not do under those circumstances? Your policy really needs to address that issue. Well, you may say, well, okay, the, the police declare it safe, but the police aren't at every call, at least not initially, sometimes maybe not at all if they're really tied up. And even if the police get there ahead of you and they say, okay, it's safe, well, they could be wrong. I mean, and you know, things could change. I mean, things are always in flux. That's why you're there, is because it's something dynamic is going on. The police may declare it safe and then have to leave to go to deal with bystanders or witnesses or traffic or, or something of that nature. So just because somebody, you or the police, have declared it safe doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. Now, you've all gone into scenes that you weren't sure were safe. I mean, the police weren't there to, to, to clear it or declare it safe. Um, I mean, in fact, in fact, probably a lot of scenes you just walk right into because it looks safe enough. And you've probably been right most of the time. But you don't want to confuse good luck with good tactics or good preparation. Bottom line here is you can never be sure a scene is safe, even if it's been declared safe. I mean, you're in a profession that has a high risk of being assaulted. You just know that. You have a much higher risk of being assaulted than you know, an accountant or a bookkeeper. You never really know if a safe scene can turn from safe to dangerous. And no one can guarantee scene, uh, scene safety. Certainly the police can't. If the police can't, you can't. So you have to remain vigilant at all times. And this goes back to the mindset thing we talked about a couple of slides before. EMT self-defense is as much about mindset as it is about any kind of physical techniques. And the bottom line here is you, you alone, are responsible for your safety. No one else can guarantee it. 
No one else can help you if you suddenly get assaulted by someone you're trying to help or someone who's on the scene with them. Whether you're talking about any kind of self-protection or self-defense, whether it's in a citizen context or a law enforcement context or even a military context, awareness, awareness of what's going on around you is the most important attribute you can develop to help preserve your own safety. You have to be aware of what's going on you have, and you have to develop this ability to potentially see danger coming or at least know that danger may be imminent. A device that will help you understand where you are in terms of your awareness and in fact help you develop uh, your awareness skills is something called the color code of awareness. And this color code assigns a color value to each of five states of awareness from way unaware on one end to you know, under conflict on, on the high end. This color code has been around in different forms uh, for decades now and it's really proven its value in both the military and law enforcement setting. But just for anybody going through their daily life, it's a, it's a valuable tool, particularly for an EMT that may be assaulted. It's a real valuable tool. The lower state of awareness is called condition white. And this is basically your zoned out state. This is when you are completely unaware of what's going on around you. And uh, too many of us spend an awful lot of our lives in, in condition white. You know, it can be when you're driving down the road and you're not really aware of anything going on around you. You just could have focused in on the car in front of you, not paying attention to your surroundings. Um, it could be when you're attending to your work and you're, you're deeply involved in your work. You're not aware at all of what's going on around you. Certainly if you're reading a book, you kind of have to be in condition white because that requires concentration. But for most of our daily lives, you don't need to be in condition white. You don't need to be zoned out. You don't need to be unaware of what's going on around you. For most of our daily lives, we can be in something called condition yellow. Condition yellow is a condition of relaxed awareness. And both those words are important. You're both relaxed, you know, not, no tension at all, and you're completely aware. And that is, you're just re relaxedly aware of what's going on around you. You know, instead of being zoned out, you're just sort of paying attention. Now, it's possible to spend your entire waking hours in condition yellow with no ill effects at all. I mean, this is not a stressful state because you are relaxed as well as aware. It's just a habit that you have to get into. Developing the ability to go around in condition yellow in a state of relaxed awareness in a condition of paying attention to what's around you is not so much a skill that you develop, but it's a habit that you develop. And the only way you develop a habit is you just do it. You just remember, I got to do it for this, for this period of time, and the next day for a longer period of time, and after a while, you just get so that you're more tuned in to what's happening around you. So condition yellow is where you want to be most of the time you're on duty, and probably most of the time you're off duty, in fact, but certainly most of the time you're on duty. The next highest level of awareness is called condition orange. And condition orange is the state you bump yourself into when you realize something's not right. You may not know quite what it is, but you know something isn't right here. Now, it, it could be something you see, it could be something you hear, it could just be some vibes you're getting. I mean, you've developed a gut by dealing with people, uh, you know, a gut instinct from dealing with people all these years on the job, and you want to pay attention to it. If your gut is telling you that the vibes here aren't right, something's not right, bump yourself up and start paying attention to what it might be that's not right. But Condition Orange is that state where you go, something's going on here, I don't know what it is. When that happens, it's very important that you train yourself not to just ignore it, not to just stay focused on your patient or your job, but to stop for a minute and say, what is it that's not right? What's going on here? You want to physically get your head up and start looking around, listen more intently, look at what everybody's doing, and see if you can't identify the source of what it is that's bothering you. The next highest state of awareness, the fourth highest state of awareness, up from orange is called condition red. And this is a pretty high level of arousal. You're under a fair amount of stress at this point. Condition red is when you've identified what it is that's wrong. It's like, that is what's wrong. That guy's got a knife and he's coming at me. This guy is getting in my face and he's advancing at me in a way that makes me unsafe. This group of gangbangers is coming in as I'm working on, on one of them. It's when you've identified the issue, you've know, identified the source of what's making you uneasy, when you've identified the problem, you know, the dangerous problem, that's what Condition Red is all about.
Now, obviously, at this point, you should be doing something. Once you've identified a danger to you, you should be obviously be doing something. You, you need to stop working on the patient if you're working. You need to challenge, perhaps, the people coming at you. Or you might want to access a weapon. Or you might want to get somewhere safer. You may not be able to get somewhere safe, but you may want to get somewhere safer. That is by putting something between you and the assailants, or by moving towards an escape route. Or you might just want to book out of there. So any or all of the above are appropriate actions once you've identified danger to you. Don't just hope it goes away. Don't just plead with them to stop. Do something assertive. Do something positive. Challenge them, move, access a weapon, get out of there, but do something that's positive and proactive. The highest level of awareness is called condition black, and this is when you're actually fighting. This is when you're actually in combat. And of course, if you're actually fighting, you're intensely focusing on what you're doing. That's the, that's the nature of that task. And of course, your, your uh, sensory perceptions are, are narrowed at that point. But the state of combat is, is combat black. Here, of course, you need some combative skills. You need some self-defense skills in order to, be, to make yourself useful to yourself, if not to your partner, uh, at that point. And your goal, remember, isn't so much to, uh, to, to do anything particular to your assailant, but it's to stop the attack and it's to get yourself to safety. And that's kind of an important distinction. Your goal isn't so much to win that fight, to deck that guy, to hurt that person, to put that person in the hospital, because you're not working out of anger. You're working out of the tactic that says, I just need to get to safety and make myself and my partner safe. And the thing about EMT work and paramedic work is that you are almost always working in pairs so that you have your partner's safety to consider at the same time. You know, just because you might be able to handle something doesn't necessarily mean that you're free to leave. If your partner is under attack, if your partner might be physically less imposing or physically less skilled than you, you need to consider their safety here too. Now, awareness should start the moment you get that call. You know, the moment, as we said, you jump in that truck, your awareness level should bump up at least to yellow if you're not there already. And you're not just about to go to work, but you're potentially going into a dangerous situation. That should be the mindset that, that, that you have. I mean, in addition to everything else you're thinking about, of course, and, you know, receiving whatever patient information is coming over the radio, et cetera, et cetera, also keep in the back of your mind, this could be dangerous because, in fact, it might be. As you get near the location, start really looking around specifically to find out what's going on in that location. As you pull into the neighborhood, as you pull into the street or around the corner or whatever, you know, who's, who's there? Who's hanging around? Who's, in, who's outside? Uh, you know, do they look suspicious? Uh, do they look dangerous? Um, do you recognize anybody? Do you recognize any signs of, anybody, uh, of anything going on? Do, do these people fit in? Do they seem agitated in some way? I mean, these are all th signs that should bump up your concern a bit. Does something about what you see tell you, I should go to Condition Orange? Because something just doesn't feel right. Something doesn't look right here. You know, a bunch of agitated people pointing um, may not be a situation you want to walk right into. If the police aren't there already, you may want to wait for the police. And if something in your gut, or, or hopefully even better, something you can articulate tells you maybe I shouldn't continue on this call, pay close attention to that. And this goes back to the policy issue we mentioned earlier. Who gets to decide whether you continue on a call or not? Who decides whether the scene is safe or not? I mean, are you allowed to do that right here and now? Are you allowed to do that a block away based on what you see? Uh, you know, policies vary. And make sure that these issues are ironed out in your policy. Because if it's not in policy, it doesn't exist. And if the policy doesn't support your safety, you want to try to get it changed, of course. When you arrive on the scene, there's something very important you can do and should do to provide for your own safety. And it'll probably also help provide for your patient's safety as well. And that is when you get to the scene, before you exit the truck, just take a deep breath and look around calmly for two, three, four seconds. That is, force yourself to stop, to center yourself, and look and see what you can see about the scene. Don't just open that door and bolt into the residence or, or wherever the patient is. What you're looking for are danger signs that something isn't right. Now, keep the truck running while you're doing this. If you see things that make you uneasy, 
If you want to gather more information, you can roll the window down just a little bit, not fully of course, but just a little bit and keep the doors locked and ask someone that might be there for more information about what's going on. If something tells you that this may be a scene you want to exit quickly, if the truck isn't already positioned in a way to simply drive away at a, at as fast as you can, then do that. You know, most cops have developed a sort of a sixth sense with their years on the job because they deal with people in distress all the time. And so do you. You've probably also developed a sixth sense. Maybe it's not quite as keenly honed towards danger, but you have developed a sixth sense about what is right in a situation, about how people normally react. You want to pay attention to that. If you get on that scene and something doesn't look right, pay attention to that and make a decision as to what to do about it. Going back to that policy issue, what does your policy say about what kind of decisions you can make or not make or, or make and not you know, be reprimanded for at this point? Make sure that, that whatever your policy says is congruent with your own safety. And if something tells you this isn't right, then decide whether you're going to flee or, or what you're going to do. But if you suspect that there's, there's real danger there, there really isn't any reason for you to be there. If you can flee, by all means, go ahead and do it. If you decide it's fine to enter into the scene, that usually means entering into a residence or a building or something like that. Again, once you get in there, just take a second, look around, do a 360 degree scan uh, by 360 if, if there are stairwells or, or landings involved. But once you set foot over that threshold, once you're starting to enter the scene, just look around and see what's there. Another one or two seconds isn't going to be critical to that patient given the amount of time it already took you to get there. You want to look closely at everyone present. You want to take in everybody there. And what you're looking for are bad guys, people with weapons, any other kind of danger signal. Docs have a term, you've undoubtedly heard it, it's called JNR, it means just not right. Again, if you get this JNR feeling when you, when you go in there, when you go start to enter the scene, when you enter the room or the, the building or wherever the scene is, if you get that JNR feeling, pay attention to it. Don't keep going. Stop and identify what it is that's bothering you if it's not obvious. The important thing to remember here is you don't want to get tunnel vision on that patient. And that happens too often. You're, you're running into the building and the patient's there and you're focusing right in on them and you're missing the big scene. You're missing potential danger. You're missing people with weapons. You're missing people that don't want you there. You're missing people that don't want you working on that patient. Stop. Take it in. Make a decision if it's safe or not. If it's safe, go ahead. If it's not, do something. Flee. Get out. Put something between you and the, and the danger. Or gather more information. But have a plan and act on it if you see something that's not right. And you can't see something that's not right if you don't stop for a second and look around and see what's there. What we're asking you to do in this presentation is, in fact, to add another task to what you're doing on a scene. And, and yeah, it's another task, but it's, it's one that's kind of important, pays big dividends, that is looking out for your own safety. It doesn't take very much time, and that's a habit you can easily get into. Another point I want to address real quick here is we tend to think of scene safety in, in black and white terms. It's either safe or it's not safe. Well, in fact, like all of life, scene safety is, is full of gray areas. You may decide that it's not perfect. I mean, you know, it's something that makes you a little bit uneasy, but it doesn't make you so uneasy that you're going to stop and not go to the little girl who's injured. So when these gray areas occur, it really just means two things. One is you want to try to gather some more information so you can find out is it closer to white or closer to black, closer to safe or unsafe. And it also means you want to get your head up a little bit more often and look around. You know, get up from your patient work, your history taking, whatever you're doing, a little bit more often to gather more information and see which way this gray area is going to migrate, which way it's going to go. Once you're working on the patient, this is where we tend to get tunnel vision. You know, somebody's working on the patient, somebody's taking history, but remember, just because you judged it's safe enough to go to the patient and begin doing what you're doing, or the police told you it was safe, don't assume it's going to stay safe. You know, sometimes that assumption is a pretty good one, uh, and, and sometimes it's not warranted. You know, more often than not, it's probably warranted, uh, but sometimes it's not, and it's the times it's not that'll, that'll get you, that'll, that'll hurt you. 
the history taking EMT every, every so often, a couple times a minute, should make a habit of bringing their head up and just looking around and then going back to what they're doing. Instead of just staying buried in the paperwork or buried in the questions uh, for minutes on end, make it, make it a habit to every now and then just get up, up and look around. And what you're looking for are things that are changing. Are people advancing that don't look right? People with weapons coming at you. Is the situation changing in a way that makes you uneasy, that, that makes, it, makes you feel that the situation might be coming less safe than it was? If that happens, if that happens, then the history taking EMT should alert the PMT working on the patient and say, hey, Joe, we've got a situation here. And at that point, you should both stop working on the patient, drop your gear. You tend to hang on to things under stress, but just drop it. Just forget about it. And do something useful here. That is, get to a line of escape. Get to an escape point or get to a line, get to a place where you can access an escape point. You can try to de-escalate the situation with your, with your crisis intervention skills. You know, if somebody is coming at you that looks severely agitated and you're concerned they're going to assault you, you might try to talk them down. I mean, you've been trained how to do that. Put something between you and the aggressor, uh, decide to flee, or if need be, fight. The point is, if the history-taking EMT has his or her head up a few times a minute to look around and take in the situation as it evolves, Hopefully you'll see danger in time to alert the other EMT and you can both then do something useful as opposed to just being taken by surprise by an attack. If you find yourself in this gray area where it doesn't really feel right to flee yet, you know, maybe this patient is critically injured, but you see things developing that don't make you comfortable, a tactic you can borrow from law enforcement, one that they developed decades ago and w works really well, has kept a lot of police officers safe, it's called contact cover. The way it works in the police world is if two officers are making a traffic stop, for instance, or going to a domestic or whatever, they, whatever they're doing, one officer and one officer only does all of the contact, does all the talking, does all the writing, does all the looking and investigating. One officer handles the whole scene. The other officer, the cover officer, does nothing but stand there and watch alertly the scene the entire time, watching for danger signals, watching for bad guys, watching for people that are about to assault them. With one person standing guard, as it were, the, the contact officer can do their job safely. They can be fully immersed in their job and do what needs to be done. The cover officer does nothing but, but guard duty, as it was. And if someone asks the cover officer, a question or about the investigation and wants to give them information, the cover officer simply says, sir, ma'am, you'll have to talk to my partner about that. And they keep looking and doing what they're doing. So if you find yourself in this gray area, don't want to leave, but something's making you uncomfortable, you can revert to contact cover mode for a moment. And what that probably means is that the, the, the uh, EMT working on the patient is going to continue working, but the history taking EMT may stop for a moment, may step back and go into cover mode until he or she ascertains better what's going on. You know, is this situation really bad enough that we need to get out of there? Or is, is this a normal development or something that's going to pass? And, and then in a moment, I can go back to doing my history taking. But this contact cover principle can work for EMTs as well as it works for police officers. If a pair of EMTs goes into this contact cover mode for a short amount of time, it allows you to deal with those gray areas that naturally occur on the job. As we said, everything's not black and white. Now, if the police are on scene, they can maintain the cover role for both EMTs. I mean, if they aren't involved in doing something else, you know, talking to witnesses or directing traffic or whatever they're doing, um, there's no reason they can't stand there and do that for you. But be aware, however, that not all police officers are as well-versed and as comfortable with the idea of contact cover as some others. So you may ask a police officer to do that, and um, hopefully they'll do it well for you, but uh, some of them may not feel as comfortable as you'd like. So when you're looking for danger, when you're trying to assess whether the people around you are about to attack you or not, or whether they're going from passive to aggressive, there are a number of pre-attack cues that are well known. Some of these include a directional look or a target glance. I mean, they may they may give you one of these glances or may look down um, at, at your legs if they're going to kick you. 
So a, a sudden glance in your direction might be something to pay attention to. They might step back, it's usually with a strong foot, if they're going to get ready to punch or kick you. Bending or flexing the knees all of a sudden. You know, if you suddenly had to fight, that's what you would do, and that's what people that are about to launch an attack do unconsciously. They might be clenching their fists or tightening their muscles unconsciously. They could be doing a sort of a shoulder shift kind of thing, getting ready to launch their momentum at you. And one you've probably seen before is the, the thousand yard stare. You could be talking to them, maybe not even talking to them, maybe they're just present, and they, they, it looks like they're looking a mile in the distance, and they're not paying attention to anybody else or anything going on, but they've just got this thousand yard stare. That's not good. Something's going on in their head that you need to pay attention to, and you really want to pay attention to that. Somebody with that kind of stare is a potential danger to you. A head bob, a weave, someone doing this kind of thing is unconsciously setting themselves up for a fight. A facial wipe, you know, you've seen that in the movies. Well, it, it happens in real life too, pre-attack cue. Somebody growling at you or unnatural vocalizations, particularly aggressive ones, pay attention to that. Jaw clenches, eyes bulging out. People that just ignore you, again, it's sort of related to the thousand yard stare. These are all danger signs, things you want to pay attention to. Somebody gets real squinty with their eyes when they're looking at you, uh, that's a sign of aggression coming on. And voice changes, uh, you know, suddenly the voice suddenly gets really low or suddenly gets really high from stress. Pay attention to that. That didn't happen for no reason. Something's going on. It could be that they're getting ready to assault you, that they're getting, their, their anger is getting ready to explode. Certainly if they voice violent attentions, you know, get out of here, I don't want you here, you know, get away from him. Um, that, you know, think about that. That's, that's, that's not normal. That's not something you want to hear. That should set you up for realizing that, uh, that, that maybe this person's about to attack you. If their words become spastic and, and distracted, that means they've got so much tension going on that they can't articulate clearly, you know, probably from anger. Twitches or nostril flares, we've all seen in people that are getting angry. Um, breathing, uh, rather respiratory rate changes, or all of a sudden somebody goes, <gasps> takes a deep breath. Well, that's an anticipatory kind of thing. They're getting ready to do something. Obviously, if somebody's face changes color, particularly if it reddens, they're getting very angry. If veins are bulging in their forehead, that kind of stuff, you've seen that before. That's not a good sign. Pay attention to that, de-escalate, get out of there, do what you need to do, but pay attention to it and do something. Other things that indicate agitation are perhaps fingers drumming on a tabletop. Um, if somebody does a fake head scratch or a yawn or a stretch or something like that, well, that's a pretty transparent, um, I mean, if it looks fake, of course, that's a pretty transparent uh, prelude to an attack. You want to pay attention to that maybe create a little bit of distance, take a step back. Um, if someone is holding their hands or their arms down near where potential weapon locations, perhaps if they're wearing a gun, they're, they're kind of inching their hand up towards the gun, or, or if, they, if they've got a knife in their pocket like I do, they might be putting their hand down and consciously touching this knife. Notice that. That's the kind of thing that you're looking for when you enter a scene. That's the kind of thing that the history-taking EMT is looking for when he or she gets his head up and looks around. You know, are people touching weapons, accessing weapons, accessing, feeling, checking, confirming locations, uh, rather confirming weapons in locations where weapons are commonly carried. If someone is seated down and suddenly gets up, particularly if it's in an aggressive, fast manner, that should get your attention. If somebody tries to wander off, particularly if they're ignoring you, and for, you know, for no good reason, that's something you want to pay attention to. That may not be good. If somebody gets too close to you, is getting in your face, well, you don't have to put up with that. You can stop what you're doing, back up, do something, do something safe, get somewhere safe, put something between you, de-escalate, do, do what seems appropriate at that time, but you don't have to ignore that. Certainly if somebody takes off a shirt or a jacket for, for a reason that's not apparent, like they're coming inside and, it, and it's warm inside, pay attention to that. Just like the fingers drumming, if their heels or their toes are tapping, obviously they're, being, they're agitated. If they move themselves over, they position themselves close to potential weapons, a beer bottle, a kitchen knife, don't let that go unnoticed. You know, either get yourself ready to defend yourself or focus in on them, pay attention to what they're doing for, because they might immediately attack you, or even ask them, say, sir, would you mind moving over here? You know, you're making me nervous. And if someone positions themselves very near to you, for moving in for no apparent reason, that's obviously the prelude to an attack or, or a potential attack. 
all those cues. Those are all things that make common sense as we've just explained them. They're probably all things you've noticed in people. Many of them you probably know intuitively. What we're asking you to do here is two things. One is get your head up now and then and look around and look for them. And two, if and when you see them, do something decisive. Either talk them down or move to a position of safety or perhaps even flee, but do something. Just Don't just put up with it and hope it gets better. Now, of course, it's not just the patient you're concerned with. I mean, sometimes patients can become aggressive and assaultive, but it's not just the patient. It's anyone that's around. You know, some bystanders in many scenes don't want you there. There could be criminal activity afoot, and they don't want you there because, you know, stuff is going on and they don't want you to see or know about. It could be gang activity involved. Uh, the perpetrators of the injury could be present and maybe don't want you working on this guy because they, they want him injured. They, they want him to, to suffer an injury or perhaps die. Uh, certain domestic incidents, you've all been at domestic incidents where the, um, the abusive partner doesn't really want you there, so they can turn violent in a hurry. Um, some places in your jurisdiction, in your city, your town, authority figures just aren't welcome. So it's anyone around that you need to be concerned about, not just the patient. So that, again, get your head up, look around every now and then, pay attention to what's going around you, who's around you, and what they're doing.